Blog Talk Radio. Chatting with Nat is a podcast for independent women seeking to speak their truth and to break down barriers. We host honest conversations that help to guide and empower women. Speak your truth and set yourself free. Let your voice be heard. Hi, everyone. It's Natalie. It's Natalie Jean. Uh, today on Chatting with Nat, we have singer, songwriter, Sarah Murdoch. Sarah Murdoch's haunting, sultry voice seeps into your bones and transfixes you from the moment she opens her mouth. Described as honey for your insides, she channels power and depth of singers from another era while maintaining a contemporary edge. Ranging from t- traditional folk music to original songs played on a baritone guitar, she's been compared to Florence Welsh, P.J. Harvey, Lyra Lynn. Sarah has performed at venues including DROM, Sidewalk, and The Knitting Factory. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm very, I'm still alive. <clears throat> and it's, uh, you know, yeah. I, I think with the, with the latest surge, I think that that's all that we can hope for. <laughs> um, that's, I think that's how we all need to uh, answer people. That's what I tell people every time they ask me how I'm doing. I'm like, I'm still alive. I woke up. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just, I don't know. Every day you wake up and there's something new. There's something different. There's something coming back. It's very annoying. Yeah. Um, so, it is very annoying. I was just seeing about like monkeypox is a thing now, and I'm like, I don't even know what that is. I can't handle it. Yes, yeah, so monkeypox. Yes, I was just like, huh? Somebody posted something on Facebook. And I was like, monkeypox. I haven't even heard about this. Then I went and googled. Mm-hmm. Yes, I googled it. And so basically. <laughs> It looks like chicken box, although worse, because the oh, the no. bumps they're they're large and they have like it looks like they have pus in them, and so oh, God, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's really fantastic. And then um, so the symptoms are like you have flu-like symptoms. You're tired. It, it really do it hurts your respiratory system. Some other obviously your skin is affected. You get a rash. It could get on your face, your whole body. Um, but so you can get it, they say by linen sheets, you can get it obviously by somebody breathing on you, spitting on you, whatever the case may be, being close contact with somebody with it. Um, there have been several cases in Europe right now with it. It's, it's not that high yet, yet. Hopefully it doesn't mm-hmm. get on. But then it says when it clears off, it kind of makes this du- dust. But that dust, when it clears off, like when the bumps or whatever go away, that can infect somebody else as well. So, welcome to uh, 2022. Um, it's <laughs> you know between the pandemic, the elections, George Floyd, Ukraine, Roe versus right. Wade, uh, uh-huh. the monkeypox, is COVID surging. I mean, I'm just waiting for the locusts. I've already told my mother, if the aliens come and they say, Natalie, do you want to get on board? I am out. I've got my bag mm-hmm. packed. I'm done with mm-hmm. all this crap. Um, so yeah. how have you been doing during all this tumultuous <laughs> It's just crazy. I oh. don't know what to say. <laughs> yeah, I've been, oh man, I feel like I'm finally doing better on a personal level, which is really nice. Right. You know, even as the world is falling apart, I, even yeah. more, I feel like I'm finally in a place where things are starting to work out for me. Last year was awful for me. I was in the hospital six times, or I was in the, I was in the yeah. ER room six times. I was hospitalized like overnight once for an emergency removal of my gallbladder. Um, oh. I had like five CAT scans. I had three surgeries. Yeah, I, I last year was awful for me. So the fact that like today the sun is shining, I'm wearing like a pretty little skirt. I'm talking to you. I'm like doing my music. That's I'm crazy. feeling so much better about where I am. <laughs> that is cr- that's a, well. I'm glad you're here too. That's a lot. <laughs> 
That is, I don't even know what you're saying. Like several surgeries, this, that, uh-uh. That's a lot. Yeah. That's I know. It was. it was. It was too much. It was yeah, too much. I, and so yeah. now I have this really, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Oh, oh, I was going to say, I have this really weird relationship with my body at the moment where, like, I I actually have, I think, a lot of anger towards my body because of everything that happened where I'm like, why did you fail me, <laughs> kind of. Um, and so I'm just working through a lot of, like, getting to, getting to, like, love my body where it is instead of, you know, thinking about what it was like before I had all of these surgeries. Um I guess I guess that what the kids say is body neutrality, <laughs> working my way to body neutrality before I get into body positivity. No, I can understand that. I mean, your body's been through a lot. I mean, damn, yeah. body parts coming out, I mean, gallbladder coming out. Just, yeah, <laughs> body parts coming out. I mean, yeah, you, mm-hmm. you, and it's okay. You take your time to readjust yeah. uh, to all of that. Wow. Um, that's crazy. Yeah. Now, one of the questions yeah. that I like to ask is this, you know, obviously, <laughs> well, obviously the pandemic was bad, but my God, three surgeries. Um, uh, but you're <laughs> uh, and we know people lost lives. Uh, people had yeah. long-term, I even had COVID. I had COVID twice. I had COVID twice. Oh, I was damn. Back, back, boosted everything I had everything I'm done I don't talk to me about any more vaccinations until you've got it done I've you got it done mm-hmm. perfect I'm just so sick right. of it I I, I I you know I'm a team player but come on now um and mm-hmm. you know the uh the world's just been crazy so that's the bad part but there's been pros obviously during the pandemic because a lot of people had downtime even if you worked from home you had a lot of time mm-hmm. for of reflection. I mean, I saw family members walking with their families, which is not supposed to be an odd thing, but people are always so into themselves these days. They don't have even time mm-hmm. for their children. Sometimes. Um, there are people that cut back on work because they realized they weren't spending enough time with their children. There are people that mm-hmm. quit their jobs. There are a lot of articles on people quitting their jobs because what, yeah. what the pandemic made them realize is that life is short and they want to do something mm-hmm. that's more aligned with their passion while making money, and that's understandable. Um, there are people je- that, um, oh, the animals. My God, when we were in outside, the pollution level was down. The animals were like, hey, mm-hmm. party time. The squirrels were like, oh, my God, we're not going to get hit by cars. Um, this fun time, <laughs> you know, climate change. Oh, but I hope those people don't come back, but we had to come back. Um, and then mm-hmm. you have artists that decided to, they created EPs, albums, singles, some people just decide I'm not doing this music thing anymore. Um, so mm-hmm. a lot of people had different mindsets during the time, and it allowed them to do a lot of self introspection. So did you have mm-hmm. time in the middle of all your surgeries? Mm-hmm. To, <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. To do um, some self introspection, inspection, and what about the stuff that you want to write or how you want to be perceived as an artist? What did you think about? Yeah, I definitely thought about a lot of that. I mean, number one, with all the downtime that I had with my health, but also in 2020 when everything hit, I was in a really weird place with where I was living in New York City, where, like, I was in a sublet situation. It was a tiny room that just had room for my mattress, and I had already been thinking about leaving the city because I was already, like, I love New York, and I still do. Um, I love New York. I love all my friends and community, but I really need more trees in my life and more space. And I'm tired of living with roommates and it would be nice to be someplace where I could afford to not live with roommates. So I wound up moving back in with my parents for a while. um, And yeah, that gave me a lot of time to think and to introspect and to really consider what it was that I wanted for my life. Um, And I think I think I'm just now getting to a pass. I've actually, one of my friends actually, um, who's very, very dear to me, is becoming a life coach, and she is a life coach. And so she's been working with me a lot to help me really clarify what it is that I do want to do as opposed to what I think that it is that I should do. 
Um, so we'll have sessions every once in a while where I might be expressing anxiety about something like, oh, this isn't happening fast enough or I'm not doing enough. And she'll be like, but do you actually want to be doing that? Or do you feel like you have to be doing that in order to be seen as successful by other people? Like what is actually going to make you happy in your life? And so that's been really great for me. And I've really, I've loved being able to, to talk to my friend Kayla about it. Um, and yeah, yeah, a lot of time, a lot of time has been spent considering how much of my day job I want to be doing versus how much art I want to be doing, what I want the shape of that to be. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, what was it about the music industry that you said, oh, my gosh, this is what I want to do with my life? Or were you one of those people that you came out of the womb? I mean, as soon as you got out, you said, okay, you felt the energy of some kind of music, and you're like, you know what? When I'm old enough, when I can speak and I can do my own thing, I'm going to do music. You know, what What was it that got you into this industry? I came kind of late to doing music. Um, I actually really wanted to be an actor, and I still do on some levels, wanted to be an actor. And so I did acting lessons when I was a kid. I did theater. I actually did a lot of straight plays. I didn't do a lot of musicals because, funny enough, people would be like, oh, you can't really sing. So, like, music was, was, even though I was taking voice lessons um, and my voice teacher thought that I was great, like, I would just, I would never be cast in musicals because I think that it's because I, I'm not a soprano and a lot of leading lady parts in musical theater are for sopranos. Um, and uh, even though I did have one teacher in college be like, you will never make a living singing. And so now yeah. I'm, I'm kind of, like, working more, more and more towards that. And I think about him sometimes and I laugh. Um <laughs> But yeah, I, mean, I didn't come to doing music until I actually had a mental breakdown after a really bad breakup um, with somebody who was abusive. Um, and so I ended up doing music because it was therapeutic for me. Um, right. And that was how I got into it. And then the more that I did it, the more that I realized how much I love music and how it allowed me to say things that acting and plays didn't. Because I was able to be like, I actually want to talk about this feeling that I have instead of having to wait for, number one, somebody to cast me, number two, somebody to cast me in a part that, like, aligned with whatever I was thinking or feeling at the moment. Instead, I could be like, I actually really want to write a song about, you know, like, I just wrote a song about all of the anger that I have towards my body and, and feeling really yeah. alien in it. And I just wrote a song about that. And it's like, I I love that about music. That if you're right. writing or if you're singing, you can say, like, I want to talk about this specific thing, and I have the power to do that because I'm the one holding the guitar. <laughs> Amen. Amen to that. Mm -hmm. And I love that you touched yeah. on that. Um, those songs um, are considered, like, social impact message songs. That's what I've deemed them as because mm -hmm. when you write about things that happen to you in your life, they're very specific, mm -hmm. and you use the tools to get you through whatever you need to get through. Um, those are social impact message songs because what that allows is for the listener who's going through the same thing, that's going to help mm -hmm. that listener. It's going to help yeah. them. So I always tell people that as artists, we have, our music is our superpower because we have the power mm -hmm. to feel, move mountains, make somebody happy, use, the, use our music when they're angry, whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. that them an outlet to be able to voice something out when, when they can't. Yeah, absolutely. They may not, they may not have the words to do it themselves. That's what I love yeah. about music. And I, I try mm -hmm. to remember people all the time is that we have the ability, oh my gosh, to affect change in people's lives in such a positive way. And that sometimes people are afraid to write about the things that they're, that they're going through in their life. And it's like, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. what are people about that but I love uh, yes. artists like you and I that write about the seriousness of the stuff that we go through and how we're going to get through that and I'm like you yeah. where I write songs that help me get through whatever I need to get through at the time so kudos to you uh, for writing that kind of music um, what I yeah. find in the music industry is that they still don't understand social impact message music they don't get it mm -hmm. I've yeah. written songs where I've you know, entered them in certain things, and people are always, oh, well, I don't know if this will chart this, any other. They People just don't understand sometimes. Sometimes you're not writing to chart. Obviously, we want to make money and all that beautiful stuff, but sometimes mm -hmm. it's about making a change in somebody else's life. Exactly, exactly. I feel like... It, it, 
it's this really unfortunate thing that has happened to many art forms within the industry where it's become mm-hmm. about like, how can we use this to sell ads? How can we use this to right. like make money as opposed to how can we use this to actually communicate with another human being and make them feel something, you know? And, and it could be that like, maybe what you want them to feel is you want them to feel a really good beat and you want them to dance and that's perfectly fine. But maybe what you want them to feel is you want them to consider a certain part about their life and be emotionally affected and go through some kind of like change within themselves. And I, I, yeah, we're on the same page about that where I'm, I'm like, I, there should be more space for music like that and for art like that rather than just, is this going to chart? Is this going to sell enough tickets? Amen. And so I'm trying to start a revolution. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm trying to get people to, I mean, especially in the music industry, to understand it. It's not always mm-hmm. all about money. Yes, we're artists. We want to make a living doing music. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. But I know for myself, I want to be an effective player in life. I want somebody to be able to say, mm-hmm. oh, I listened to Natalie's song and it really helped me get through this. Or mm-hmm. I was moved by something. So I uh, I, to- I totally 100% agree with you. Um hmm how important, obviously I know the answer to this already, but I have to ask it. How important mm-hmm. is it for you to be authentic um, in your music and in your life? Oh, that's a good question. I, yeah, I definitely want to be an authentic person in my music and my life. There's been a couple of times where I have thought to myself, should I do a stage name for performing? Because sometimes... Mm-hmm. Especially when I first started out, I would have so much anxiety about being seen as myself as opposed to being able to hide behind a character that I was like, should I do like a stage name? Would that help me be more confident? And I'm glad that I didn't because I, yeah, I really love the opportunity to be able to stand up on stage and be like, this is, this is what I want to talk about. This is what Sarah wants to say as opposed to doing some kind of music persona. Not that those are bad, but it's just, it's not, it's not me, you know? <laughs> no, I completely understand. It's funny because I had an interview with another young lady. She was um, a rap artist and she had a different name. I think it was Little MC and by her, she had her birth name and she called her, she called that her government name. And I was just like, well, well what do you want me to call? Her? No, I want you to call me Little MC because she said Little MC just, was just, her and I love that. Mm-hmm. You know, I love that. Yeah. Also, if you want to stay with your own name and that's your identity, that's what you do. No, I yeah, no, yeah. I agree. I, I mean, I myself yeah. thought about changing my, but I like the name Natalie. So, um, and I like my last name. Mm-hmm. So I can do all kinds of things yeah. with that. I completely understand that. Now, mm-hmm. you sing traditional folk music, music, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, I do. I do do that sometimes. That was actually how I got into doing music was I joined um, a traditional folk singing circle in New York City that my mentor led. Um, He was my acting mentor and my very dear friend and helped me get through, you know, my shit that I went through. And he was like, you know, you should come to the singing circle and you should just try singing. And I was like, okay, great. And I went and I like, I liked, um, you know, some traditional folk songs I knew about in Pennsylvania, but I wasn't aware of the depth and the breadth of traditional mm-hmm. folk music and how much there is and how wonderful some of it can be. And so, yeah, I discovered it and I was like, oh my God, this is all amazing. I love this. <laughs> no, 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 I mean, so, but when you, when you write your own music, do you stick to the traditional side of things or do you write the way that you want to write? Kind of both. I try, what I try to do when I'm writing music The things that I love about traditional folk music is that even though they were obviously written about specific things, in some cases even like specific events or specific people, they've managed to be universal enough that they've lasted hundreds of years. Um, And so I try to be like, you know, what, how can I write about something that's specific to me, but leave it open to interpretation for other people so that other people can see themselves in the music. Because that's, that's one thing that I love about traditional folk music is that like five different people can sing the same song and they'll Mm -hmm. all get something different out of it. And they'll all communicate something different about it, even with the same set of words. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm like, when I am writing, it's not that I'm like sticking to like a specific formula or anything like that, but I, I look at a lot of those old songs like poetry 
and look mm-hmm. at the way that they use phrases and turns of words. And, and I try to say like, how can I, how can I maintain like a universality in my music? I also do tend to like write more about like, you know, sirens and forests and right. <laughs> and like things like right. that as opposed to like he didn't text me back, like, you know. Yeah, which I which I love because the radio station's inundated with that type of music anyway. Um mm-hmm. yeah. It gets on my nerves. But um that's a whole nother <laughs> topic. Uh, no, but I love that. Um because I think the music un- industry also doesn't understand that music evolves. It evolves. Mm-hmm. You don't have yeah. to write the same way for, for the rest of eternity. Like, for example, uh, last was it last year? Last year I learned, even though I do country music, I didn't know about this, is that, and I need to buy a book on this too, is that country music, they they want you to rhyme. You you have to rhyme. And I'm thinking mm-hmm. to myself, why? Isn't the whole point to tell yeah. a story, right? You're just telling a story. Mm-hmm. I sit down and I try to write a song, you know, I, I when I try force myself to do okay chorus chorus verse no no sorry verse mm-hmm. chorus see, my brain is lost verse verse chorus and then verse bridge ver- whatever you know mm-hmm. I, I that it's lost in translation it doesn't mean that I don't do that sometimes if it's needed but I find that when I'm writing I, it's better for me to write like it's a poem I mean chorus is yeah. It could be one word, two words, three words. You make it what you want. And so what my exactly. narrative thing is I want to write the way that I want. And I tell people this all the time. When you go to an art gallery, nobody says to the artist, why did you put that splash of yellow? Why did you do that blue? Oh, what is that? No. They allow uh, people that draw and paint to be who they are. But when it comes mm-hmm. to music, it seems that, you know, everybody wants to criticize. Well, you should have done this and you should have done, done that. Mm-hmm. And it's just ridiculous. Why can't we do what we want in the music industry? Now, another woman told me, you know, well, radio stations have a certain format. But I said, that's that's only because we've enabled that format. We've enabled mm-hmm. it. And fight against the system and say, look, there's new music out here. What are you going to do? Inundate us with the same artists until they die off? So then how do we get right. to this? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Exactly. Yeah, there's so, there's so many different ways to write a song. It's so silly to right. me whenever people are like, well, you have to have the chorus come in within the first 30 seconds or, you know, whatever rule they want to put on it. Yeah. Um, and I mean, like, sometimes constraints can be really helpful for you breaking out of a pattern and being like, like, I, I was doing a, a songwriting class with the Philadelphia Folk Song Society. And one of the prompts one week was to write a song based on a riff, which I never do. And I actually wound up writing like a really fun song that I, that I've been playing around and people love it, but it's something completely unlike what I would have done before. Whereas I would have been like, well, what dark tortured thing does Sarah want to talk about today? Um, And so there's sometimes when I, when I'm like, yeah, like give me, give me a format and let me see what I can do with it. But whenever anybody is like, doesn't offer it as an option, but says like, yeah, if you don't do that, you won't be successful. There's a part of me that goes like, well, who are you to say that? (laughs) Exactly. No, I listen. I'm I'm with you on that. I'm not no mm-hmm. not gonna tell you what to do. Um, so I'm gonna play your song in the dark. Tell me what that's about. Okay. So this, oh my God, there was this guy that I was in love with. I I thought that he was the one for me, and so I wrote this song a couple of months into us seeing each other, and it was about that first time that we actually met in person, and that first time that I saw him, and I like fell in love at first sight. But nice. even when I was writing this song, I there was already problems with him not committing and it mm. being just like a classic situation shift. And right. so, um, yeah, writing this song and a part of me knew that it was not going to work out, um, but still hoping for it. You know, that moment when a new thing begins, and you're like, oh, my God, maybe this will be different. Maybe you'll be right. different. Maybe you'll be a better person than what I've had in the past. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's about it's about all of that hope, but like the back of your head knowledge, knowing that it's not going to happen. I love it. Let me play it. Rain coming down, drowning in the sun. Strangers pass me by and they leave me in the dark. Cars in the town, but there's nothing 
out the round and I try to still my breath as I wait. And then there's you with a kindness in your eyes and I offer up a prayer. Was beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, so <laughs> do you ever look into uh, doing uh trying to get your songs into sync and licensing? Into what? Sync and licensing. Oh, that is that is something that I need to look into. Yeah, it it's funny because um. I think because I come from like an acting background and I did that for so long before transitioning into doing music, I, there's so many times when people will be like, like you just said, like, Hey, have you thought about thinking and licensing? And I'll, I'll have this moment of like, Oh my God, that's right. I can do that. I don't need to wait for somebody to like give me permission to do it. I can go do it myself. Yeah. There so, are yeah, I, uh, sites for that. Um, mm-hmm. Where people can, uh you know, submit their uh, their music to online uh, businesses that do that for a living for sync and licensing. I've done it several times. Um, mm-hmm. I can say some stuff. It, but I find it interesting. I ask a lot of people that I interview on there. A lot of people say, no, I haven't even thought about that. But I think that maybe I should um, look into it because you have a great voice. I can definitely hear like, oh. and, um But thank you. And, or documentary, TV commercial, whatever the case may be. So you should definitely, in my opinion, pursue it. I think that mm-hmm. would be um, And that's also another avenue that you can make money. I mean, let's let's just be honest. Uh, mm-hmm. You can't make money through streams unless you have a huge following, even with millions. Yeah, of people. exactly. It's, it's, the thing, um, here, talking about money, here's the thing that I want to do. I want to get on the college circuit is what I want to do because they will apparently pay you a lot of money to come and play at a college. And really? I'm like, you know, I would love, yeah. So I have a friend um, who does my taxes, and mm-hmm. she's a performer. She, did, she has a one-woman show that she does. 
And she okay. was telling me the last time that she did my taxes, so like a couple months or last month, oh God, what a time. She was like, Sarah, I do college shows, and I am one of the people who makes um, less money than maybe like musicians or something like that. I get paid like $1,500 to do one show at a college. And I was like, excuse me? And she was like, yeah, what you got to do is you, you, it's like apparently you join um, an association and then you go to one of the conferences that they have, which is where they book performers. You do like a, like a 15 minute set to basically audition for all of the college bookers. And then they book you and you can say like, yeah, you know, my, my price is going to be like $1,500 for a show plus travel or like $2,000 for a show plus travel. It's blowing my mind. And that I'm like, that's what I want to get into. Give me some real money. You just blew my mind. So what association do you join? Oh, there's one for the Northeast um, route. So like okay. Northeast colleges. There's one for um, the Southeast. Um, I think that there's one for like the Pacific Coast. Okay. And then maybe one for the, for the Midwest. But if you Google, and for anybody else who's a musician who's listening to this, if you Google how to uh, play music at college shows or how to get on the college music circuit, there'll be a bunch of articles that will come up that will tell you, like, what the names of the associations are. I can okay. never remember because I'm terrible with names. But definitely, definitely look into this. Thank you for the info. You see, that's why we do these shows, because the thing is you can learn something from somebody. I love that. That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 That's, that's yeah. Whenever I, I whenever I learn a new thing, I'm like, I want to tell everybody. I want everybody to be successful. Yeah, this is why. I'm always like, this is fantastic stuff. Everybody's got to do it. I love that. No. Because mm-hmm. here's so I um, recent release, recently released a song called Blocked. Okay. It's about blocking people on social media. It's a country song. Mm-hmm. And so, and I pushed it, blah, blah, blah. And I said, you know, I really want to push this on co- college radio because I think it would work because you know, college mm-hmm. people, teens and all that stuff. They block people all the time on social media. And, and some of the, mm-hmm. the people, that, the places that I use, like play MPE, you know, to push my music to radio, they're like, well, you know, it's kind of country, but it's, uh, I said, mm. I said, this one is a little bit different. And I, mm-hmm. it's done really well, but see, I like, like this information because one of my mm-hmm. things on my to-do list is to, uh, you know, get all the college radio stations and try to push it to the DJs at the college radio. Because I just want to see myself. Because, yeah. like I said, things evolve. You don't know what song is going to do what, wherever. Yeah, exactly. Know? Yeah. And I also feel like college radio stations would be more open to new and different kinds of music. Yeah. Because I feel, and I feel like especially, like, the young kids now, um, the young, listen to me, yeah. I said, the young yeah, kids, no, uh, those, those whippersnappers, I feel like, I feel like they're more open to things and they're, and they're, you know, they're not settled um, in like, I must like this one certain thing. They're, they're more interested in different ideas and opinions, which yeah, I like no. about them. I like this. I like this new generation. Yes, so do I. You're exactly right. Now I'm going to play your song, Cold Mountain. Tell me what that's about. Mm-hmm. So that is a traditional folk song. Um, it was written by Texas Gladden, I believe, who is a woman or was a woman. Um, mm-hmm. There's three verses to it, but I only sang the first verse um, for this recording. Um, but yeah, I was taught this song by Elizabeth Laprell, who is a pretty influential traditional folk musician, played at Carnegie Hall. Um, she's, she's amazing. Go listen to her music. Absolutely. Uh, but okay. she taught me this song. All right. Cold mountains, they are here around me. Cold waters gliding down the stream. Oh, when I sleep. I think I find him, but when I wake, it's just a dream. (laughs) 
That was beautiful. Another good one. Another great one. A good, great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that Uh, song. I love that song. That was beautiful. Now, um, how do you feel about the whole, uh, you know, I don't understand why women have to be so competitive, especially in this field. Uh, You know, with Sisters of Music, Nikki and I are always saying that the stage is big enough for everyone. It just is. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, societal pressures make women uh, more confrontational, more competitive Mm -hmm. with one another because they feel that they have to, you have to look this way, you have to sing this way. You know, I even, this isn't even a woman, but somebody once told me, well, maybe if you sang this song this way, they wanted me to sound like somebody else. And I'm like, you do know that's not me, right? (laughs) Right, yeah. You always have to remind people these days I'm not that type of artist. What I do is totally mm-hmm. different. And so it really reminded me about how, like, radio stations and just people and want us to be all the sound the same. Okay? Mm-hmm. Just sound the same. And, and then yeah. on the other level, they want us to compete with one another. I, we, Nikki and I personally don't believe in the diva behavior. That's one of the major things mm-hmm. about our platform. We want everybody to uh get along we want everybody to be reminded no matter where you are Mm -hmm. in uh, in your career that we're all nobody's above us nobody's below us we're all in this playing field so what do you think Mm -hmm. about all of this i agree one thousand percent absolutely i hate how women are made to compete against each other i i i think that it's you know, the way that the power structure that we all live under, you know, and historically have lived under for thousands of years has tried to keep women powerless by making them, by giving the idea that there's a scarcity of places for women. And that therefore, if there's only one acceptable way for women to be, we all have to strive to be that one acceptable way. And we all have to compete for a limited number of spots. And it's not true at all. You know, right. I I love it whenever I see my friends succeeding. I love it whenever I see other women succeeding in the business at all because it's like if, if they can succeed, that just creates more opportunity for other people. It's not like there's a limited little pie slice that we're allowed to have and we've all got to, you know, slash each other's throats for it. It's, right. it's that if, if, you know, like with what you're doing with this show, you've created this show and now you've created more opportunities for other people to be lifted up. Like other yeah. people's success, other women's success only leads to better things for everybody. And it makes me so mad whenever women are told that we have to compete with each other or that you're told that you have to sound like somebody that you don't sound like. Cause why are they saying that? They're saying that because, you know, in their mind, there's only one acceptable way for a woman to sound. And so if you're outside of that notion that they have, then maybe other people are going to start sounding like you. And then that's creating a whole other, you know, branch of music that maybe they don't want women to have access to. I don't know. Maybe I'm getting on a soapbox a little bit, but I feel like <laughs> I, no. I love it when women succeed. <laughs> and I, I want them to succeed as themselves authentically and not have to feel like they need to, you know, m- oh, like this whole thing about women's bodies going in and out of fashion makes me so right. angry. Um, like, you know, in the nineties, it was heroin chic. And then in the two thousands, it was still like very thin. And like now all of a sudden it's all about the BBL. And it's like, why is it that women are put under this pressure to change their bodies every like 10 years in order to fit what an advertising executive thinks will sell ads? Like it's, it's really horrible and I don't appreciate it. Yeah, no, I agree with you. That's why I don't listen to that stuff. Listen, I have, during mm-hmm. the pandemic, just something came over me where I was like, I can eat whatever I want. I always buy yeah. Oreo cookies. And I, that, I don't normally eat that. And yeah, well, it did affect my body. Um, I gained mm-hmm. a lot of weight doing that because I was drinking beer. Anyway, um, mm-hmm. but after that, you know, after my mind came back to, to reality, you know, I got a Peloton and I work out all the time, but I do it for myself. I don't do it yeah. because of peer pressure from the outside world. I I do it mm-hmm. for myself. I used to teach aerobics and it did nonsensical that I ate an entire box of Oreo cookies. But hey, 
this is what I say. It's a pandemic. I do what I want. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. People, need, women need to start thinking for themselves. If you're happy with mm-hmm. your body, it's okay. you leave it alone. Who cares about the, mm-hmm. uh, the, the, the world out there? Because um, the rest of the world, they don't live with you. They don't live with you. They don't. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, yeah, it, absolutely. It, how, you know, the world has so much, you know, that we allow um, the world ha- to have so much influence in our world. It's just, I, mm-hmm. just, I just don't get that. But it is what it is. Yeah. And if, yeah. And if, if women are so preoccupied with making sure that their body fits the latest style and if we're so preoccupied with making sure that we fit the i the quote unquote ideal and that we're quote unquote the perfect package that we get the one slot that we believe is available to us then we're so busy competing with each other that we're not lifting each other up um and yeah and so i'm like that's why i absolutely am like yes like be healthy take care of yourself um, you know, especially after last year, I'm like, I'm like working my way back towards like being healthy and taking care of myself. But it's also like exactly like you said, like, are you doing it for you? Like, what what are the reasons why you are doing things to your body? Is it because it's you're you're wanting to be healthy? You're wanting to like be happy? You're wanting to like just feel comfortable in your skin? Or is it that you feel a pressure that you have to look a certain way and you're trying to conform to society's standards? Because exactly. one I'm absolutely supportive of, and one I'm not. <laughs> no, no, I'm I'm with you on that. I mean, today I posted a I post inspirational quotes every day, and I put I am an unaffected by the judgment of others. I just don't have time for mm-hmm. it anymore. <laughs> I mean, you would think that after mm-hmm. living through stuff that we've lived through in the past two three years, people would just get over themselves. Right. Don't a lot of people judge me for yeah. a lot of things I say post because I'm just crazy, but I love mm-hmm. me. It got and yeah. it got and it took me a long time to get where I, I am with my own personal love of self that I won't mm-hmm. let anybody break that down for me. I just can't. And I think a lot of women should really focus on themselves and what they need in their lives. Um I think people need to do mm-hmm. that. It's just they just have to have the mindset for that. Um what are um what, there was a question there's a question I always ask and mm-hmm. what are two things you wish you had known? before you got into the music industry? Ooh, I wish that I had known that I was the one that was in control. That's, mm. That is like the number one thing that I wish that I knew. Um, yeah, I wish that I wasn't under the impression that I had to give over control to somebody else um, mm. in, in the way of like, uh, you know, well, I, I, cause when I thought, when I got into it, I thought to myself, I would really love it if I could perform somewhere. And right. then I kind of waited for six months being like, well, if I'm good enough, somebody will ask me. And mm. the answer was like, no, actually you can contact the venue yourself and you can say like, Hey, I think I'm great. I think I could do a really good show at your venue. I would love to come do it. May I please come perform? And like, people will say yes. Mm. And so that's right. that's what I wish that I had known instead of like kind of sitting on my hands and waiting. And I also thought I also uh, in that same vein uh, wish that yeah wish wish that I had given myself permission to just do more sooner because um, like I just the the two songs that you played I just put out on Spotify even though I recorded them back in like 2020 before the world fell apart. And I kept sitting on them and waiting because I was like, but are they perfect? Are they perfect? Are they the best that they can be? And at some point I just had to be like, they're, they're good enough and you can let them go. You can let them into the world. And if, if you keep on waiting for something to be, it's never going to happen. So yeah, those are the two things that I wish that I, I'm still working on the perfection thing. I'm still working on the permission thing, but I wish that I had embraced those a little bit sooner. Awesome, Josh. Well, one of the things that I wish I had known that this is a very hard business. It's extremely hard. It's a lot of work. Mm-hmm. Four seven. There's a lot of things that I've learned that you have to do. So writing and creating and marketing music is totally different than back in the 1960s, 1970s. Why? Mm-hmm. Because we 
on streaming platforms, social media platforms that we have to be on. And so yeah. now when you're creating a song, you don't have to do this, but most people, when you're thinking about doing all that stuff, you need to think, does it work on these platforms? Will somebody mm-hmm. use it? How can I get somebody yeah. to use it? Because as we talk about making money in this arena, you know, getting it on, mm-hmm. you know, obviously your music can be already be on TikTok, but if somebody takes it to another level, my God, you you will be seen and heard. And that's just a beautiful mm-hmm. thing. Um, but it's way yeah. more work. It's way more work. Every, I mean, it's TikTok, so much more work, yeah. I, I just finished like this TikTok university thing um, that they sent to me and it was very interesting and taught me a lot. And uh, and it's like, they're like, oh, you need to post five videos a day. And I'm like, who the hell has that time? One. <laughs> Yeah. And but I'm learning, but I'm learning to do it. I mean, the videos don't have to be long. Um, mm-hmm. And it's also about trying to get people like to sponsor your music or use your music. Like for example, this one woman, she did like th- these videos had to be ten seconds each. She didn't like a mm-hmm. Microsoft. Logo. So she t- said that to them in the first video. Second video, she's like, "This is what your logo should look." She just embedded her face in the logo, and then the third logo. The third video is you see Microsoft using her logo with the logo with her face. They, she designed the logo for Microsoft. That was it. <laughs> it was brilliant. It was brilliant. Yeah. Um, there's other people that have they they um they talk about a specific product that they really love, right? Mm-hmm. And so this one this was one about it's called Coochie. <laughs> got coochie lotion coochie cream but it's basically to shave mm-hmm. women's private parts and and so the woman gets on there she's like oh my god this is great do you know the company took what she said put it on the bottle and it sold millions it, i mean now she's like a spokesperson, oh and she's a spokesperson for other people. so the other thing is partnering with someone because when when you have a business profile you can't use your own music but because they're the commercially li- commercially licensed, but you can partner with these different pl- people to be able to get your huh. music for use your music. So the idea is that you t- and I tell this to everybody now: take uh-huh. a product that you love, especially as an artist. I don't care if it's a microphone, a guitar, a pick, whatever you're mm-hmm. using in the music industry. You do a TikTok video on it because if you're looking mm-hmm. for sponsors. You're looking for money. The, 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 this is the way to do it. Because yeah. I was, they talked about how some of these people were getting more of those people's products sent to them because um, it basically was like a commercial for the mic, for the drum set, for the guitar, for the pick and stuff like that. So, as mm-hmm. you know, this music industry has just gotten vast. It's a lot of work, but we're here and we're doing it. Lastly. Absolutely, yeah. What is a quote, a message, whatever that you'd like to use, you know, on a daily basis or whenever, whenever you're feeling down or happy to motivate yourself? Mm, there was a thing that David Bowie said. Um, I don't remember it perfectly word for word, but paraphrase what he said was um, when you start that making art is kind of like wading into water. And that when you get to a part of the water where you kind of feel things fall away and you feel like you're getting out of your comfort zone and you're not really sure of yourself, that's when you can actually end up creating something really exciting. And so he was saying that he himself was always trying to like push a little further in and do a little bit more and, and stretch himself further. And so I think, I think about that, especially in moments where I feel insecure or where I feel anxious about, you know, maybe, putting a song out or, or, you know, submitting to a thing. I'll right. think to myself, like, what would David Bowie do? <laughs> David Bowie yeah. would keep going. <laughs> yeah, and, and if that works for you, that's a beautiful thing. And I think we should listen to that as well, because let me mm-hmm. tell you, there is some advice out there that's, that, that's just fantastic. My thing is mm-hmm. um, I, write, I write my own narrative, you know, uh, a lot. Mm-hmm. I, and, I, and I came up with that because, you know, People get interviewed in the press, and sometimes what they say is not the thing that they said. And they get upset. I said, but you allow yeah. that to stay there because I always say, if you can't get it right, take it down. I don't need the I don't need the press. Yeah, yeah. you have yeah. to. I write my own narrative. You don't write the narrative for mm-hmm. me. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. 
So, yeah, that's my thing. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for being on Chatting with Nat. It has been thank you for having me. Oh, I mean, thank you for the advice and all the good stuff, the good stuff you, you gave me and the rest of the world uh, to try mm-hmm. to do the college circuit. I'm going to get on that. No yeah, I'm going to see if I can find the article that lists all of the associations in it that I'm thinking of. I'm going to try to find it and send it to you. That would be awesome. And I will send you sometime this week or tonight um, the list of places that you can uh, uh, do sync and licensing because I think you definitely have what mm-hmm. it takes to be able to do that. I think you should go for it. I would love that. Thank you. All righty. Well, everybody, this was Chatting with Nat with singer-songwriter Sarah Murdoch. You can find her at www.sarah-murdoch.com. Instagram is Sarah Murdoch Music FB, which is Facebook, is Sarah Murdoch Murdoch Music, and she's on Spotify as well. And if you don't remember that, you can Google her. Yes, the internet is great. You just type in the name and bam, Sarah Murdoch is there. She's awesome. You got to listen to her, follow her, but don't stalk her. You can follow her. (laughs) All right. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. Until next time on Chatting with Nat. If you're a Kia K5 GT and Kia Forte GT owner, this is your reminder to breathe. See that sophisticated interior? Enjoy those sensations. And now, imagine how you look from the outside and that speed that only a Kia GT sedan can give you. Sorry, I can't help but get excited. For those life full of thrilling emotions, the all-powerful, all-fun Kia GT sedan. Kia, movement that inspires. Limited inventory available. Call 800-333-4KIA for details. Always drive safely. Hello, it is Ryan, and I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on ChumbaCasino.com. I looked over the person sitting next to me, and you know what they were doing? They were also playing Chumba Casino. Coincidence? I think not. Everybody's loving having fun with it. Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino-style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere, even at 30,000 feet. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus. That's ChumbaCasino.com and live the Chumba life. No purchase necessary. BGW. Void. we prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.